Bulgarian researcher The New Earth Lady suggests she can show us why the so-called glorious thousands of years ancient history of China is nothing but fiction, bedtime stories. As you read these bedtime stories, she suggests, you will be left with the impression that they are based on some sort of mysterious chronicles. These alleged ancient chronicles, which we barely have access to, are barely two or three hundred years old, she believes. Also, they want you to believe that the stories are based on some sort of very ancient recorded astronomical observations. She wants in this video to show us that these observations are actually very recent and the oldest horoscope that they have is barely some 300 years old. To fix the problem with the obvious lack of correlation between the historic artifacts and so-called history, genuine historic sites are in this condition within the lattice garden, while so-called historic artifacts like the Great Wall of China, which she adds, is actually still being built and is very modern and are loudly advertised by the historians and the tourist agencies. In China there are actual historical ruins of various walls. But isn't it strange, she suggests, that the arrow slits in some of them are facing in the direction of China, and not in the direction of the imaginary invaders? The Chinese people did have their own actual history and records, but when the military force arrived, as usual from Europe, the same story as in America and seen in Japan in the previous episodes, and a pattern which will be repeating itself in future episodes again and again, she states, their priority was to erase the history. In China, she believes, they drugged the local population literally to the point that they forgot who they were. That's how the traditional history was substituted with the mainstream fairy tales, and that's why historic sites like this with high-tech tool marks are ignored, and maybe that's why they found the modern artifact in a so-called grave. All the grottos and caves we have seen so far are included in the official history of China. The historians find some place for them. If needed, they make up their own hypothesis and then present it as fact, but somehow they fit them in somewhere. But when it comes to the Kuashun and Long Q cases, we get total silence. 
Mainstream historians strongly prefer that they are not even mentioned at all in any cost. They classify them as mysterious and use more beautiful words like magical grotto of theological nuggets while scientists weren't really versed in magic, she states. How can they say this is magical? What does magical even mean to them anyway, she asks. The actual reason to avoid any debate about these caves are the tool marks left by the equipment used in them, she believes. Compare the high-tech tool marks from China with this quarry from Estonia, which is barely a hundred years old. And still, the marks on the walls are very chaotic. Now compare the historic Chinese tool mark with the latest modern equipment tool mark. The network of labyrinths is so vast that it stretches over 10 kilometers. Practically an entire mountain is made hollow. There is no trace of the stone that was taken out, which of course should have been the size of the mountain itself, she states. Was it taken off site, or was it spread around and by one of the great floods? It seems to the Chinese, they had a good record of their own history before the fairy tales were forced with military power and drugs by the European colonists, she believes. There are plenty of references to advanced technology in the traditional Chinese chronicles. They had metal flying dragons that was transporting beings throughout the universe, not just Earth. There were metal servants that they were using to do the hard work, which we would today call robots. And their mass media was much more important than ours because they were well aware of the developments of the war between the parasites and the humans, she believes. For example, she continues, they reported in the chronicles that at one point some of the non-earthly beings involved in this conflict closed off contact between earth people and their allies the godly beings of the universe. It really appears that, compared to the Chinese people of the past, we are in an informal blackout these days. According to the chronicles, even the first emperor of China was a non-earthly being. This is supposedly the burial pyramid of his son. Although both the father and the son didn't exist, according to modern scholars, they assured us that they were buried even though they were never born. Wikipedia says that this is the only pyramid in China which is extremely strange, given the fact that China is the home of hundreds of pyramids, some of them very, very large. They aren't open for research, but they leave the impression that they are also made of earth. But there are stone pyramids as well, she states. Now let's visit an actual ancient historic site in China to see how it matches the history. It looks kind of new to her, she states, for a person who lived 8,000 years ago. It looks as new as the pavement around it. The emperor lived apparently 8,000 years ago, but only in the imagination of the people, and then they made the tomb for him a thousand years ago. The tomb was then renovated 300 years ago, whereas the entire complex surrounding it had long disappeared. 
she asks your pardon when she points out that this is not renovation. This is building from scratch. So, she points out, 300 years ago, somebody made something pyramidal here. Probably the stones we see are actually 20 or 30 years old, if not much less. And this, apparently, is shown to the people as evidence of many thousands of years of history within China. And she continues, these types of sites are shown to the tourists as being 2,000 years old. Yet how come the wood didn't rot or petrify? This is not a desert area, she states. These structures were recovered from damp soil. And if they were indeed that old, they should have completely rotted by now. And then an alleged Swiss watch found in a 400-year-old Chinese tomb was an obvious red herring of time travel. Not to belittle time travel research, as finding out the truth about time travel is just as important as finding out the truth of our origin. But when we are sent to the wrong address to look for the wrong thing, we don't find out the truth about either time travel or the dating of the actual pyramidal tomb, end up with rules which favour only one certain group. After observing all these discrepancies between actual artefacts and history in the books, you start wondering, how did this commonly accepted history of China appear anyway, she asks. In the 7th and 18th century, there was a lot of activity going on in terms of establishing or creating the Chinese history. The history of the previous dynasties, which was unacceptable to the current one, she believes, and that is why there was the need to create private histories in the year 772, and the government collected every printed book ever issued in China. The process of gathering all the books continued for around 20 years by a committee that oversaw the collection of the books by using 360 men. All the books were separated into four categories, which took a couple of years. 3,457 of them were printed again in a new form, and the rest of them, mainly 6,766, were only catalogued but some under different names. And this complete rewriting and issuing of completely new books happened at at least three or four times in the Chinese history. We don't know exactly how many times because there was no records from the rewrite to another and each time there was a language reform which made it very difficult for the people to understand the older hieroglyphs. The hieroglyphic writing of China is one consisting of symbols and as people were forced into language reforms they did not only lose part of their history which would no longer be recovered from the earth chronicles even if they wished to but most importantly they were losing connection with the paradigm of the advanced civilizations which led the bedrock of their culture So what is the aftermath of these language reforms and writing of private histories, she asks. Anybody who has tried to read the chronicles that are available unanimously agrees that this is the most chaotic and unsystematic historical record that they can imagine.
So these murky waters of the history of China gave scope to the modern history fabricators to unleash their imagination, and they did so without any pang of conscience. And so we read about the fairy tale kingdoms that existed thousands of years ago. But what was the dating based on, she asks? It would seem that they based it on the recording of sophisticated astrological observations that were running in an interrupted line in China for thousands of years, she states. Please pay very close attention, she suggests. The following are continuous records of sophisticated observations, and here is the proof in its entirety. These are taken from a book, a very respected mainstream history book, that is a product of international research, and here is how they explain it to us. These are not some parts of a clay vessel. These are astronomical records and observations of sunspots, which are recorded on them, and because of this, the pieces of clay pot must be at least 5,000 years old that shows undoubtedly that the Chinese at the time had, a, had sophisticated observatories marking and studying and recording the sunspot activity. And by the way, how did they conclude that these pieces are four or five thousand years old, she asks? Well, that's not even mentioned in their so-called research. That is just a given as a fact of the evidence of the existence that cannot be doubted for any reason, she believes. But this superb historic comedy doesn't end there. They continue that this isn't the only proof that there are other examples of their sophisticated observatories of the ancient Chinese. A Neolithic hero has been unearthed in Paiyang in Hunan, China. On both sides of the buried skeleton are mosaics made of seashells, one of them representing anger and the other a dragon. Somebody expressed the opinion that these shells could be placed there keeping in view the positions of the stars and since this Neolithic burial mound should be some 5,000 years old, from this we can conclude that the astronomical observations of the Chinese started at at least around 5,000 years before Christ. She points out that she didn't make it concise. That was the full research. That was the full proof of which they based the dating of dynasties that they found in the unsystematic chronicles. In brief, what is the rest of the book about? There is somewhere in this chronicle a mention that people gathered and watched how the stars aligned in the sky, and that means that they watched the special alignment, apparently, that happens every five or six thousand years, and it occurred exactly five thousand years ago. How did they guess that, she asks? There is no mention where the planets would be, or what the alignment in what degree. There is basically nothing. It says the people were watching the sky because there was something happening there. On the basis of what this so-called scientific research, it has been established that these various Chinese kingdoms developed thousands of years ago, while in reality, we have almost no clue what was happening in China before the 7th century. On one side, the Chinese historic records were corrupted by continuous language reforms, and on the other side, the general population was helped into forgetting the original advanced culture, which they had some connection with, rewriting their hard disk what human is, because the original humans possessed a purity that was naturally in harmony with nature and the cosmos, she believes. The full setup of happiness and harmony did not fit well with the new paradigm, which was artificially imposed upon the humans.
Amongst the artifacts of Chinese culture called Hongshan, we find this interesting statue, very much resembling an Egyptian goddess or the samurais we saw in the previous episode, or Lord Shiva from India. He is also depicted with a crescent in his hair that looks very similar to this. Many other similarities and elements of art and culture prove that the Chinese were well connected with the world. And this worldwide culture, which she identifies as the survivors, call them gods, deities, or even aliens. But don't be confused by the different names. It all boils down to the same thing. Tall beings who came and mixed with the simple local tribes and taught them philosophy, art, crafts, and culture. But from those relatively far away times, suddenly we don't have any records from China due to the book burning and writing of so-called private histories. The earliest relatively reliable records that we have comes from the Manchu dynasty, she states. It really seems that the Manchu people were the last wave of survivors, she believes. First of all, they were foreigners and their language is still alive today in some villages, so we know for sure their language is radically different from Chinese. Just look at the architectural style of the Manchu people, and there will be no question left in the terms of their origin. No, this is not a mistake, she states. These are ruins in China, not in Europe. And by the way, there is linguistic evidence that the very name of the dynasty Manchu originated from Mughal. And those are the same Mughals that were the last wave of the survivors in India and currently are confused with the Mongols. The people of modern Mongolia were certainly part of the worldwide culture and certainly its influence was stronger as we see it in the East and Central Asia where Mongolia is located. But to put an equation mark between the modern Mongolians and Mughals mentioned in the other text is a mistake, she states. For example, in the Chinese chronicles that we are talking about, there is a description of the Mughals being very tall white people with blonde hair and blue eyes, and that's how all other contemporary writers describe them. So how did the mainstream historians read these chronicles, she asks? Exactly like the devil reads the Bible. Here she states, it says Mongolians lived in China. Mongolia is close to China, so there must be some type of mix-up. But they didn't tell you that it is not Mongolians from Mongolia, but Mughals. And as far as the descriptions of outer appearance of these Mughals, that's deleted, just skipped as if it's not just there. The Manchu people claim they are descendants of a dynasty which ruled over the entire planet. That would be a kind of a ridiculous statement, and out of place if they were indeed the small insignificant tribe which the mainstream historians try to convince us they are. They were so obscure that nobody ever recorded anything about them. But such a claim would be completely normal if the Manchus were indeed descendants of the rulers of Tataria, who seem to have had the last connection with their souls and brains, she believes. By the way, a lot of the material in this episode is just concise quotes from the works of Anatoly Fomenko. A lot of it is translated into English and published for free on his website. So if you want to find a lot more interesting information, you can visit the website and, by the way, the Manchu dynasty ended up in China, again fleeing from Siberia, or at least some part of them. 
but the record suggests that, that some came from the modern day Macedonian territories, she believes. It was most likely an international gathering of survivors. Some of them went to Japan, founded the samurai dynasties, just another division of these warriors settled in China. So what were they fleeing from? Why did they abandon their homeland? It was like... It was like this, she states. In the older times, there were no countries, in a sense, that we know them today. There were just tribes and nations. But as the parasitic influence was increasing, countries started to appear. The powers that be began to use the tactic of divide and conquer amongst these countries in order to have the people kill themselves, rather than having all-out war against the parasites. When the survivors also found themselves in such a situation, they also had to make some sort of a country, and that was Tataria, which was immediately broken into pieces, and then these pieces were defeated separately. The last standing one, or at least one of the last standing, was in Siberia, and when the last piece of Tartaria was defeated by the newly formed Russia, the general population simply remained to live in the land where they were born, and gradually its memory was washed away by the mass media. But the army, the military force didn't wish to settle with such a life that seemed like slavery, and instead decided to flee to relative safety in China and Japan. She believes some of the remnants of their style of combat are found in the Eastern Martial Arts. Since all records about that area have been meticulously destroyed, we know very little about these things. Although they happened relatively recently, but whatever little is in the works of Anatoly Fomenko, it is presented here. The time after the king of Tataria was murdered, there was only a young prince left. Maybe the army took him to relative safety in Japan or China. Another interesting detail from the Chinese chronicles is that the Manchu people were foreigners and that they were very small in number. They were trying desperately not to mix with the local population, but since they were so fueled, their assimilation within the local race became inevitable, and it was just a question of time. A very curious note was made in the Chinese chronicles that says that after the Manchu people were assimilated by the locals, they lost their special abilities, possibly the psychic abilities they used to fight. She finds this very, very important. So maybe the Tatarians still had some special abilities that they had learned from the Hyperboreans, or they had a mixture of Hyperborean blood flowing in their veins, she suggests, and that's why they had their special abilities. Now what about the other numerous Chinese dynasties, which according to the mainstream wrote about Chinese affairs for many thousands of years? Although nothing can be said for sure, as mentioned previously, the chronicles are very confusing and disorderly, but she presents a hypothesis by Antoli Fomenko which seems to be the most sensible one, until we have further additional information at least. So when the Manchu people came to China, they wrote down the history of their own dynasty which happened in the various other lands and that was their history. Later, 
when all this writing of so-called private histories and confused chronicles started, possibly dynasties which existed at other geographical locations are now viewed as Chinese dynasties, and there's good points supporting this hypothesis. For example, there were Huns in this history. The Huns, the Hungarian Huns, were in Europe. Okay, She points out, just one name cannot confirm anything. But the neighbours of the Huns were the Serbians. The Serbs in their own language, they call themselves Serbies. So they are the neighbours of the Huns. And then in the north, the Chinese chronicles also talk about a tribe of the Cheche. Cheche. Cheche is a term the Czech people call themselves. So what about Czechs and China? Within mainstream terms, all these tribes existed in the past, and now they have all disappeared. Did they disappear, she asks, all of them? Or maybe they are well and living in Europe. The northern territories of the ruling dynasties were tribes known as Schweni, a term used by the Nordic people of Sweden to identify themselves. They certainly are located in the north, but it would make more sense if you're, let's say, in Europe, when you say they're in the north. If the chronicles were written for China, as we know it today, that would be east. There are just some resemblances in terms of the names of the tribes. There's a lot of commonality in events which happen in the Chinese accounts and those within European history. It is very interesting, and if you wish to find out more, go online to the works of Anatoly Fomenko. Stumbling across an interesting blog, its author described a visit to a Chinese town of Wonyi, which was also the site of the largest burial complex that supposedly belonged to an emperor, Zhan Swan. And there are a few old photographs of the location. It all looks very different nowadays. In the beginning, it was okay, like these old photographs display, but when the author started walking around, he discovered that the Chinese had a very practical attitude towards history. Finding this cave, he wondered if this was the shrine of the emperor, or maybe it belonged to the queen or something. But even if it's an ancient shrine, even that can have very practical applications, she believes. The author's journey to the town was very informative as to the current culture in China. To reach the town, he took a local bus for some 40 kilometers. He was hoping he'll be there in an hour or so. However, it took a full day. How is that possible? Well, due to the innovative marketing strategies of the person who is responsible for selling the tickets on the bus, 
This lady made the bus stop at every corner and she would get down and try to convince bypassers that they had to go with them. People were trying to refuse. She would not take no for an answer. It seems she would actually try and drag them onto the bus. Innocent women were screaming and some of the stronger men even tried to defend themselves. This is China of today, she states. Hopefully the modern Chinese people will do something about it, otherwise all the glorious kingdoms which lasted 8,000 years may suffocate under a couple of meters of plastic bags. There are roughly three to four times more pyramids in China, at least visible ones, she believes, than in Egypt. And in addition, they are in much, much better condition of preservation than the Egyptian ones. And yet, not many are aware of this. And finding out more details about them is next to impossible. Even on location, people have tried to gather more information. And usually, if you try, for example, to take photographs from closer proximity, very quickly some Chinese guards will emerge from nowhere and make it clear that you can't do that. Actually, she points out that the Chinese even admitted that when people started flying on airplanes, too many photographs of the structures emerged. Before then, China denied having any pyramids. The situation with the geoglyphs is even more interesting, she states. She doesn't know if there are more in terms of quantity than the Nazca geoglyphs, but there are certainly more information, so to speak, because many of them appear to be functional, and they're connected, plugged into modern installations of some sort. One of the pyramids, at least one, is plugged into these networks, there was somebody, she states, who made a very interesting documentary about this, but his channel had been removed, and his website and blogs have simply vanished. The new Earth Lady only touches on topics which may allow her channel to exist longer as lately measures have been taken against people who speak the truth. And restrictions are getting tighter and tighter, she believes. People who are telling the truth about what's going on find themselves blocked and when people type in their web address a message pops up from their own security which advise you not to continue as there is malware on the site or worse. The reality is that the given website has only the truth, no malware, no spam, she states. 
So everything seems to be allowed in the universe and everybody has freedom. So the people, most of the people, don't mind. They don't know or they don't care that the truth is suppressed in such a way. And this situation is very advantageous for certain parties who surely want who surely won't hesitate to explore it further, and warns to the would-be explorer that you will very rapidly descend into a darkened informational abyss. Whatever you hear, whatever you see, everything will be a lie, and you won't be able to trust your own eyes, because in one of her recent videos we saw how certain filters can be put in front of the image of the sun, and it can get dark. It can blink. So all this could be similar to some sort of circus magic, she believes. So who knows? Maybe the skies will be turned into a gigantic monitor where all kinds of deceptive holograms may be shown to us. But our own will in this area is the most important thing. And those who have made a different choice, who in their heart have decided that they have zero tolerance for any type of lie and deceit. And these people will always refuse to take any part of the violence in crimes, no matter the reason and explanation. They will have the power to see through all the lies. Even though everybody else around will believe the deceit which will pour from all the newspapers, radio and TV stations. And these are not predictions based on the Bible neither, she states. These are predictions made on the basis of what has been happening to people who speak the truth within the last couple of weeks, she believes. <laughs> 